So in this example, um, so what you guys are going to have here is functions. And more than likely than not, ladies and gentlemen, you're probably going to see your function or whatever problem you see will probably be in this format. Okay. So I wanted to teach from the graphs because I didn't want people sleeping. And I wanted them to kind of see what, how the limit reflects to the graph. Because you know, using your graphing calculator would be the best thing for you guys as far as evaluating the limits. However, as I mentioned, your graphing calculator is not your holy grail. You, it's very, very important to make sure you guys know algebraically what you can do. And the best, best thing you guys can do, please not. The best thing you guys can do to evaluate the limit is what we call direct substitution. So going back to something that we did first, if you guys remember this problem, right? You guys remember that function? Okay. And I said, what is f of zero? Now, guys, we I made up some random equation, right, for that function, but we didn't know really know what zero was, but we knew that. Um, you could just look at the graph and say that 0, if you were to plug 0 in, you got your output value was 3, correct? So we knew that the value of that function at that point. And then again, what was the limit from the left and the right? You guys remember? It was 3. All the limits were 3, right? Because that was the value of that function. Where that started to change, though, we started getting the do not exist once we started getting into holes right, and asymptotes. So you have to be careful when, you're, when your value is undefined. But how do you know it's defined or undefined unless you plug it in? So the first thing I would do if you guys have a limit problem is to evaluate what we call applying direct substitution. So if you guys plug in direct substitution here, you would have 2 squared minus 3 times 2 minus 10 all over 2 minus 3. So 2 squared is 4 minus uh, 6 minus Minus 6 is going to be negative 2. Minus 10 is going to be negative 12. Uh, 2 minus 5 is going to be a negative 3, which equals a positive 4. Follow my math? And that would be your limit. Your graph you know, looks something, I don't know what the graph looks like, but um, we'll look about that in a second. Now, what happens, though, if you can't apply direct substitution? Let's look at this first example. Limit as x approaches 5, f of x. Can, can I plug in 5 there? No, I can't plug in 5 because that makes the denominator equal to 0. So there's either a whole or there's an asymptote. In chapter 2, we remember we practiced on how to determine which was which, right? And to do that, we basically just factored, right? You guys see a trinomial up there. You know that's it's factorable. So if I factor this, I know that I have uh, x minus 5 times x plus 2 all over x minus 5. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Those divide out. So that means at x minus 5, we have a hole. So therefore, I can write x plus 2 because there's a hole. And then now can I apply direct substitution? Of course you can. 7. OK? Cool? No, not cool? All right, let's go and take a look at the next example. So in the next example, we have an issue. Because here, they're giving you the function. We're not talking about f of x. But in this example, we have x divided by x plus 1 minus 3. Now, can we apply direct substitution here? Can we plug in negative 1? No. Can we factor it? No. So we're kind of stuck, right? Now, the one thing I do know by inspection, I do know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. Would everybody agree with me? Because I know that's where, the, that's where my function is undefined. So what I would do is take my calculator, and I just go in, and I'm just going to graph this. So I do x divided by parentheses x plus 1, and then minus 3. And when I go ahead and graph it, I get a graph that looks something like this. Something like that. Asymptote is at negative 1. Now, is this enough information, though, for me? Because can I now evaluate as x gets closer and closer to negative 1 from the left and from the right? Right? And what value are we approaching from the left and from the right? Does not exist. So by using graphing technology, we can sketch the graph and then identify and determine that this is a does not exist. OK? All right, next one. So over here. Now we have an infinity problem. Crap. Now remember, infinity was like n behavior, right? Yes? 
So first thing I want to do is, how do you directly substitute in infinity? Well, to give you the short answer, you actually just increase your values. You like do 1, then you direct and substitute 10, then direct substitute in 100. And you want to kind of look at what the pattern is and where the function is going. But that is way too much work. So we're not going to worry about direct substitution. Um, what I would say is, let's look at this. Can we simplify this in any form, in any way? Uh, I mean, it's not really factorable. There's nothing really factoring, right? I'm not saying, I mean, that's not really fact. Uh, actually, you could say that's the difference of two squares, right? But then that's not factorable, so nothing's really going to divide out, right? OK. So, but the one thing I notice is this is a rational function. And rational functions have asymptotes and holes, right? So I look at this. The first thing I do is find the vertical asymptote, because if you guys remember, vertical asymptote was the easiest to find. It's basically what makes your denominator equal to 0. But rather than solving that, I'm just going to do this in my head. Guys, if you set 2x squared plus 3, you're going to minus 3 to the other side. You're going to divide by 2. So you're going to have x squared equals negative 3 halves. Well, if you square root both sides, which would be next, you're taking the square root of a negative number, right? So you're going to have complex vertical asymptotes. Basically means your real number system, you're not going to have real asymptotes. You can turn it to the bottom bin when you're done. Um, so there is no vertical asymptotes here, or at least no real vertical asymptotes. What about horizontal asymptotes? The horizontal asymptote test, remember, was compare your degrees. And if they're the same, then your horizontal asymptote is y equal to the leading coefficient over the leading coefficient. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. Actually, I don't want people to be confused. So let's write it as like that. All right? Now, do I know what this graph looks like? No. Do I really even care what this graph looks like? It doesn't really matter, guys, because what do we know about um, vertical asymptotes? Or I mean, horizontal asymptotes? We know that the horizontal asymptotes are going to be approached, right? So from the left and from the right, we are going to be approaching these horizontal asymptotes. The graph could look something like that, or it could look totally different. But it doesn't matter. The end behavior is going to be approaching your asymptotes. So as x goes to infinity, what value are we approaching? Value are you approaching? Yeah, 2. So the answer would be 2. OK? All right, last but not least, everybody's favorite, piecewise functions. OK? Now, piecewise functions, guys, are really, 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 really not that bad. All you guys got to do is your function, piecewise function j of x, is just graph each function individually. The first one is the absolute value of x. You guys should know what the absolute value of x is. That's the v-shaped graph. You guys spent algebra 2, remember? Did a big time in algebra 2 on v-shaped graph, absolute value. It looks something like this. OK, it's also been displayed on my wall since the beginning of the year. So, um, if you always need a refresher, you could always look up there. But the piecewise function says, I only want to evaluate for the absolute value of x for when x is greater than 0. So that means anything that where x is less than 0, like negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, is not a part of my piecewise function j of x. So what I'm going to do is simply just erase it. And is 0 a part of this absolute value either? No. no. So we're going to make a nice hole there. The next one, all right, well, the next one is uh, negative x squared. Actually, I made a mistake. I got to go plus 1. Sorry about that. Um, negative x squared plus 1. So again, let's think about quadratics. We know that negative x squared, that means the parabola is now opening down. And the plus 1 is outside the function, so that's shifting it up 1. So it looks something like this. However. It says, I only want this function to be defined for values of x that are less than 0. That means all values that are to the left of the y-axis. So we're just going to erase the rest of this. Does everybody see how I graph both of them together? And then I just erase the parts that were not defined. Yes, no, maybe so. OK. So now, having an understanding of the graph, now it's much easier to understand like the left the limits. The limit of j of x from at going to 0, so as we're getting really, really close to 0 from the left. As we get really, really close to 0 from the left, we are approaching 1. 
from the right. As we're getting really, really close to zero, we are approaching zero. And then from the left and the right, are we going to the same spot? No. So therefore, it is a does not exist. Okay. I would say, guys, those are your four main types of limits. Um, there's also some 